Hi there, it's November 12th. This is skill check number nine on hypothesis testing. So Julie and Molly run a coffee shop. Julie reckons that 30% of their customers leave a tip, but Molly believes that it's something less than that. Julie decided to collect data to prove her case. So for the next few days, Julie will toss a coin after each customer pays. If the coin comes up heads, that customer will be included in her sample and she will note whether or not that customer left a tip. Once her sample size reaches 50, she will stop. So the first question is concerning the conditions that are required in order for us to assume that p hat is approximately normal. The first condition, randomness, is satisfied because Julie is using a coin toss to determine whether or not a customer is in her sample. Independence is a bit tricky by contrast. So here we, we could say that we have independence provided whether the next person Julie includes in her sample leaves a tip or not is not influenced by the choices of previous customers. Now the reason why this takes a bit of thought is because, just for example, if I was standing in line and the person in front of me left a tip, I would be more likely to leave a tip as well just by social pressure. Another example is if you have a group of people who know each other, maybe they work in the same office, uh, as they go in, if one of them leaves a tip, then the probability that others in the same group will leave a tip is probably a bit higher because of that social influence. Uh, and so there are some reasons to argue against independence in this case, and this provides a nice example where independence may not be uh, guaranteed. However, if the customers are chosen for the sample, are chosen in such a way that they cannot influence each other, then we'd be more confident about independence. And so what we could do is instead of tossing a coin for each customer to determine whether or not they're in the sample, we can toss a coin for every 10th customer, right? So that way, if one person is in the sample and let's say they leave a tip, the people directly behind that person are not going to be in the sample because we're going every 10th person. So the whole point of this is just to emphasize that independence is something you have to think about. So for your purposes in this course, almost always independence is going to be assumed. If independence is violated, it'll be, it'll be very, very clear that it's violated. Um, the nuance behind independence, um, as I'm presenting here, is something uh, directed toward students, say, who study psychology, and at some point who might be designing their own experiments. They would have to keep in mind this requirement of independence. So for our purposes, we're going to assume that we have this condition. The 10% condition, by contrast, that's very easy. The sample size is 50, which is much less than 10% of the total number of customers, so the sample is not too big. Uh, the sample is also big enough and how do we know that? Well, if the probability that a customer leaves a tip is 30%, as we will suppose it is under the null hypothesis, then we can expect to see 15 customers who leave a tip out of a sample of 50. And that means 35 of them will not leave a tip uh, in expectation on average. So on average, we can expect in a sample size of 50, about 15 people will leave a tip, 35 people will not. Both of those numbers are bigger than 10, so the success-failure condition is satisfied. Next, we're going to state the hypotheses, and we're going to say whether it's an upper-tailed test, lower-tailed, or two-tailed. So the null hypothesis is that 30% of customers leave a tip. The alternative is that this number is something less than 30%. In symbols, we can write this. And we can see that this will be a lower tail test because the alternative is that the population proportion is less than. And what that means is when we draw our diagram, we're going to be working in the lower tail of the normal distribution. That's why it's called a lower tail test. Next, we're going to calculate the uh, standard deviation of the sampling distribution. That's easy under the null. The, the center or the mean of the sampling distribution is 0 0.30. We have a sample size of 50, and so we can use those numbers to calculate our standard deviation. We get something just a bit more than 
I should have said a bit more than 6%. Now, before we continue, we're, go we're going to set up a decision rule. And in order to do that, let me remind you that if we were to construct a 90% confidence interval, the critical value would be 1.645, which means we're, we would go 1.645 standard deviations above and below. And that's because that's the critical value that puts 5% into each tail of the distribution and 90% in the middle. And so we need this number because we're going to conduct our test at the 5% level of significance. And so we need the same critical value. So here we're going to make our decision rule. I'm going to use a diagram. This is a standard normal distribution. And we need a value, uh, a boundary point, below which we will reject the null hypothesis and we need uh, that probability of rejection to be 5%. So in other words, we need 5% in the lower tail. And as we just saw, the critical value that gives us 5% in the lower tail would be minus 1.645. So that gives us a rejection region. If our test statistic is less than minus 1.645, we will reject the null hypothesis. If it is anywhere else, then we will fail to reject. So the decision rule is Julie will reject the null hypothesis if the test statistic falls to the left of minus 1.645. I just want to emphasize something. If the null hypothesis is true, then the probability that we will reject, even if it's true, the probability of rejection is 5%. In other words, 5% is the probability that we will falsely reject the null hypothesis. Right? So we keep that in mind. That's an important nuance in these uh, hypothesis testing scenarios. The level of significance defines the risk we're willing to take to falsely reject the null hypothesis. In this case, that risk is 5%. Okay, now turning to data, we have 13 customers out of 50 left of TIP. And so we'll keep in mind that the sampling distribution for p-hat under the null hypothesis has a mean of 0.3 and a standard deviation of just over 6%, which we calculated. So we can use those numbers to standardize our p-hat. So p-hat is 13 divided by 50, that's 0.26. Standardizing, we get a standard value of minus 0 0.62. And so keeping the decision rule in mind, you can see that we will fail to reject the null hypothesis because our test statistic is to the right of our critical value. In other words, it's in the green zone where we will not reject the null hypothesis. And so we can say there is insufficient evidence to reject the null. And we know because the test statistic is to the right of the critical value for this test. Next, we're going to calculate a p-value. In order to do that, we need to turn to the z-table. We will look up the, the uh, test statistic, minus 0 0.62. And we can see that that gives us a lower tail area of 0.2676. And so the p-value for our test would be the area to the left of minus 0 0.62. That's the area shaded. That area represents the probability that if the null is true, it's the probability we get a test statistic as far to the left or further than what was actually observed. That gives the area in the lower tail. So that area is 0 0.2676. And you can see that p-value is bigger than 10%. And so we can say that we have no evidence to support the null hypothesis, sorry, to support the alternative hypothesis. So the p-value of the test is 0.2676. There is no evidence to support the alternative hypothesis that the true proportion is less than 0.3. Finally, let's ask this question. Does this mean that Julie, who claimed that the true proportion is 30%, does this mean that she's correct? 
So Julie proposed that the proportion of customers that leave a tip is 0.3. There was insufficient evidence to reject this null hypothesis. But that does not prove that the null is true. The true proportion could be something slightly more or slightly less than 0.3. We don't know. And so the point here is even though we did not reject the null hypothesis, we did not prove it to be true either. And this so turning to the next scenario here, we imagine that Kyoko runs a factory that makes computer chips. Over the past year, only 83% of chips were free of defects. Last week, Kyoko's engineers made changes to the manufacturing process that they hope will increase that number. To test this, Kyoko had her engineers inspect a random sample of 120 chips made using the new process. So again, let's just go over those conditions. We have randomness because they took a random sample. Independence in this case, the fact that the sample is random makes it likely that the probability that any given chip is not defective is independent of the state of other chips in the sample. In other words, we're going to rely on randomness in order to assume independence. The 10% condition, the sample is 120. That's clearly going to be much less than 10% of the total number of chips manufactured. So the sample isn't too big. And the sample isn't too small either because if the sample is 120, and if the probability that a chip is not defective is 0.83, then in a sample of that size, we can expect approximately 100 chips on average to be free of defects which means about 20 will have defects on average. Both of those numbers are bigger than 10, and so we're good. And so given these conditions hold, we can now assume that the distribution of p hat is approximately normal. Here we're going to state the hypothesis. So the null is that 83% of chips are not defective under the new process. The alternative is that more than 83% of chips are not defective. In other words, the alternative is that changing the manufacturing process improved the quality of the chips. In symbols, or you can write it as you can see there, and what kind of test is this? This would be an upper tail test because the alternative is that the population proportion is more than 0.83. So we're working in the upper tail of the, of, the, uh, of the normal distribution. Next question, we're going to calculate the standard deviation. So we know what the mean is for the distribution of p hat under the null. We can use that number and our sample size to calculate the standard deviation. In this case, it's just a bit more than 3%. So before we continue, let me remind you of critical values for 95% confidence interval. So as you can see here, the critical value is 1.96, which means if we put boundaries at 1.96 and minus 1.96, that will put 2.5% into each tail of the distribution, 95% in the middle. So we need to keep this value in mind as we construct the decision rule for our test, which is to be conducted at the 2.5% level of significance. So, working with the standard normal distribution, we need a boundary that will give us 2.5% in the upper tail. And what we're saying is if our test statistic is to the right of that boundary, we're going to reject the null. The probability that that happens, even if the null is true, is only 2.5%. So in other words, the probability of a false positive is 2.5%. What value do we need to put for that boundary? That's going to be the 1.96. So that means our decision rule is that if our test statistic is to the right of 1.96, in other words, more than 1.96, then we will reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, we will not reject. Right, so Kyoto will reject the null if the test statistic falls to the right of 1.96. Here we have some data keeping in mind what the distribution for p hat is under the null hypothesis. We can take 104 divided by 120. That gives us p hat, p hat in this case 
we subtract the mean under the null and divide by the standard deviation, we get a, uh, sorry, a, a test statistic of 1.07. So in other words, 0.8667 is just a bit more than one standard deviation above the mean value 0.83 under the null hypothesis. So keeping in mind our decision rule, here clearly we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So there is insufficient evidence to reject the null. We know because the test statistic is to the left of the critical value in this upper tail scenario. Now to calculate a p-value, of course, we have to go to the z table. Looking up 1.07, we see that the area to the left of that number is 0.8577. So we have an area of 85.77%. What we want is the area on the other side, so we have to subtract from 100%. And so here, our test statistic was 1.07. We need that shaded area. Again, the p-value is the probability that if we were to do the test again, and if the null is true, we would get a test statistic of 1.07 or bigger. In other words, it's the probability that we would get a test statistic at or to the right of the value that we actually observed. That's the area shaded in green. That area is 1 minus 85.77%. It's 14.23%. So you can see that a p-value bigger than 10% means there is no evidence in support of the alternative hypothesis. And so that's our conclusion here. The p-value is 0.1423. There is no evidence that the new process produces more than 83% non-defective chips. And so what will the engineers tell Kyoto, Kyoko uh, about the new manufacturing process? They will have to say that the changes to the manufacturing process have not improved the quality of the chips. Okay, last one. Khaled estimated that about 18% of cars in downtown Toronto are blue. He then challenged his sister Aisha to prove that the proportion is not 18%. So Aisha used her cell phone to take a picture of three randomly selected parking lots. She then counted the number of blue cars and the number of cars in total in those photos. So, starting with the hypotheses. The null is that 18% of cars in downtown Toronto are blue. The alternative is that the proportion of cars in downtown Toronto is not 18%, it's something else. And so, to write those in symbols, in this case, we're going to say the alternative is that the true proportion is not equal to 18%. That makes this a two-tailed test. What is the minimum sample size required in this scenario if we are to assume the sampling distribution of p hat is approximately normal? So what we need is the expected number of successes and the expected number of failures in a sample of size n and to make sure that they're both at least 10. So how do we do that? Well, in symbols, we would say, I want that n times 0.18 is at least 10. I also want n times 0.82 as at least 10. So the top in equation is, the, is what the expected number of successes will be. In other words, the expected number of blue cars there will be on average in a sample of size n. And the second in equation is the expected number of cars that are a different color. Both of those values have to be more than 10. And so the trick here, um, we look at the proportion that is the smallest. In this case, 0.18 is the smallest of the two. 10 divided by that proportion gives us the smallest sample size required. So that turns out to be 55.55 if you, if you go 10 divided by 0.18. And so we're going to make the sample size at least 56. That's the minimum size. And just to emphasize that point, if I just get out my calculator here, uh, if you take 56 times 0.18. That's the expected number of blue cars you'll see on average in a sample of size 56. That's bigger than 10. And likewise, if you take 56 times 0.82, that's also bigger than 10. So we're good. Right, so the minimum sample size 
is 56. Next, what is the mean and standard deviation? Uh, again, we can start with uh, looking at what the proportion is under the null, and we can look at the sample size. Here, we're told to assume the sample size is 63 cars. The proportion under the null is 0.18, and so using those numbers, we get a standard deviation for p hat of just a little bit more than 5%. Uh, perhaps here I should say just a little bit less than 5%. Yeah, that would be correct. Yes, okay. A bit less than 5%. Right, now here, we're looking at this diagram. We saw this diagram earlier. In this case, we're conducting a two-tailed test. A two-tailed hypothesis test is very similar to a confidence interval. Here, we're looking for critical values that will put 2.5% into each tail. Those values are plus and minus 1.96. So we can use those to make our decision rule. So again, starting with the standard normal distribution, we're going to put in those boundaries. Those are the boundaries that put 2.5% into each tail of the distribution. And so what we're going to say is if our test statistic falls between those two numbers, we will not reject the null. But if our test statistic falls to the right or to the left, then we will reject the null hypothesis. Now check it out the probability that our test statistic is in the red zone, if the null is true, is 5%. That's what makes this a 5% test. So you can see how the level of significance was split between the two tails because it's a two-tail test. Right, so our decision rule, Aisha will reject the null hypothesis if her test statistic is more than 1.9 standard, 1.96 standard deviations from the mean. In symbols, you could write this. We're going to reject the null if the absolute value of our z-score is more than 1.96. Uh, turning to the data, keeping in mind what the distribution of p hat is under the null hypothesis, we can standardize 18 cars out of 63. So 18 divided by 63 is 0.2857. Standardizing that value, we get 2.18. So in other words, our p hat is 2.18 standard deviations above the mean value, which is 0.18. So remembering now our decision rule, here, clearly, we're going to reject the null hypothesis because our p value is in the red zone. And in particular, our, sorry, did I say p value? Our test statistic is in the red zone. And in particular, it's to the right of 1.96. So it's in the upper tail in this case. So we can say there's sufficient evidence to reject the null. We know because the test statistic, 2.18, is more than 1.96 standard deviations away from the mean. Okay, now we're gonna do the p-value. So we have to look up that number, 2.18. And we see the value, the area to the left is 98.54%, and so in the upper tail, we get 100% minus that, 1.46%. And now here's the trick. For a two-tail test, you need to remember that the p-value is going to be twice that number because the p-value is the probability that a test statistic is more than, than 2.18 or less than minus 2.18. In other words, the p-value is the probability that if the null is true, our test statistic will be 2.18 standard deviations away from the mean or more in either direction. So we're going to fill in that upper tail. We're going to fill in that lower tail. Those two areas added together give us a p-value of 0.0292. So 0 0.0292, that's more than 1%. But less than 5%, and so we can say that there is moderate evidence that the proportion of blue cars is not 18%. Okay, that's it. So thanks for watching. I hope you found this helpful, and I do hope you're looking at this over the reading break. Uh, I want everyone to be feeling strong and confident for the last part of the course, which is coming up starting next week. In any case, 
whenever you're watching this. I hope it was helpful, and uh, I'll see you in class. Bye-bye.